Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and welcome to Apes Video Notes for Topic 8.2, which will cover human disturbances in ecosystems, and today we'll be specifically focusing on marine ecosystems. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe the effects of human activities on aquatic ecosystems, and the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will involve applying a mathematical relationship to solve a problem, and we'll want to show our work here using kind of a unit conversion or dimensional analysis setup. So the first topic we'll talk about today is range of tolerance. We have to understand that all organisms have a range of tolerance for the conditions of their habitat or their ecosystem. And today we'll be focusing on how human actions can shift those conditions outside the range of tolerance. So remember that when we're talking about range of tolerance, we're referring to things like pH, temperature, salinity, so how salty the water is, sunlight, nutrient levels. And just like organisms have a range of tolerance for these different abiotic conditions here, they also have a range of tolerance for different pollutants or toxicants that humans can introduce into their ecosystems. And so what we want to do in this unit is specifically focus on those sources of pollutants, but also their effects on organisms. It's oftentimes not enough on an APES FRQ to just say that an organism will die or an organism will be harmed by these toxicants or these pollutants that are introduced. We have to think about specific effects. So here's a list of some very detailed physiological stressors or outcomes that organisms can suffer when they're introduced to these pollutants. We have limited growth, so an organism may not be able to get the food it needs or its body may not be able to undergo the growth processes due to these pollutants. We have limited reproductive function, so they may not be able to reproduce because their sexual organs have been impacted or their uh, hormonal systems have been disrupted in some way. We'll find out that's the case with a lot of compounds. They could have difficulty breathing or respiring. It could lead to suffocation if the oxygen level is low enough. Again, as I mentioned earlier, hormonal disruption, uh, endocrine disruptors are a class of compounds that can really throw off the growth, development, and reproduction of many organisms. And then you can potentially cite that an organism may die, but typically that's going to be if the pollutant is lethal to them and if it becomes in a high enough dosage. So as I've said this before, the solution to pollution is dilution. And so you just want to kind of be aware that typically a pollutant would have to reach a fairly high level for the organism to die. And we'll actually talk about later in this unit how we can measure how high that concentration has to get to cause death. And so the big takeaway here is that in Unit 8, and really all in Unit 7 as well with air pollutants, we want to look at the specific effects of pollutants on organisms. It's not enough to just say they're going to die or be harmed. We want to try to pinpoint some specific impacts that these organisms suffer when they're exposed to these pollutants. So I want to just point out here that this slide was actually cut from the acid deposition video. That video was getting too long and I realized it fit a lot better here. Um, so just be aware that this may seem like it's a little bit out of place, but it actually fits really, really well with organisms range of tolerance when it comes to pH. And so this clip is just taken from that acid deposition clip and slotted into 8.2 where I think it fits a little more naturally. Now we're going to look in a little more detail at the environmental effects of acid rain on aquatic species. And so remember that all aquatic organisms and really all organisms on earth have a range of pH tolerances. So what that means is certain species can tolerate lower pH or higher pH ranges than others. So if we look at this example here, we can see that there are some really insensitive insects that could survive even if the pH decreased all the way down to four. We also have eel and brook trout that could survive a pretty low pH relative to things like crustaceans. And so this can be helpful in assessing how, you know, what the extent is essentially of acid deposition or of acidification of soil or water. Let's look at why these pH tolerance ranges differ though. As pH decreases, so as a water source or soil source becomes more acidic, it can move outside the optimal range for a species. And so again, that can cause the species to drop off in their population because members are starting to die. Well, why do members of these species die when the pH decreases? Well, one reason could be aluminum toxicity. And so aluminum could become more soluble and aluminum is toxic to many, many organisms. And so it could actually kill them. It could damage their nervous systems and cause you know, failure of the nervous system and they die. Um, we also have disrupted blood uh, regulation. And so all organisms that have a blood-based system need some level of tonicity or some level of you know, osmolarity in their blood. And these H plus ions in really acidic conditions can disrupt the balance of sodium and chloride in their blood, and that can result in death. 
So these are two kind of physiological reasons that an organism might die in a really low pH condition or in acidic conditions. Well, this is helpful because we can use these known pH ranges of organisms to use what are called indicator species or to identify indicator species. What it means is basically it's the canary in the coal mine idea. So the idea being you used to bring a canary down into a coal mine because birds are smaller and more sensitive to air pollution. And if the canary, you know, hit the bottom of the cage and went belly up, you knew it was time to get out of the mine shaft. Um, and so this kind of idea holds true in environmental science. We use certain species that we know are sensitive to pollutants as indicators. And so some examples here would be this white moss or this filamentous algae. And so they actually tolerate low pH conditions well and thrive in lower pH. And so if we survey a pond or an aquatic ecosystem and we find a lot of these species, that's an indicator that pH is probably lower and there's probably been acid deposition in the region. On the other hand, crustaceans and mollusks, which have shells that are calcium carbonate based, they're gonna deteriorate when the pH declines too low. And so we don't see them really surviving far below a pH of six. So if we survey the area and we have a thriving crustacean or mollusk population, that could indicate that the pH is probably above six and there probably is less prevalence um, of acid deposition or it's been less polluted with H plus ions. So this is actually another repeat slide as well, but this is from later on in unit nine, but it just fits so perfectly here with this discussion of range of tolerance. Now we'll take a look at how coral reef ecosystems can be really vulnerable to shifts in temperature. So we need to remember here that a coral reef is a mutualistic relationship. So this is actually going to be between coral, which are a tiny animal, and the individuals are called polyps. And then there is an algae that lives with these organisms, and this class of algae are called zooxanthellae. So there's your uh, apes word of the day, zooxanthellae. These are algae that supply sugars to the coral while the coral supply carbon dioxide and basically broken down organic matter for the algae to use for photosynthesis. Um, they can take in nutrients, they can take in the carbon dioxide and create energy. So it's a really beneficial relationship. The problem though is that many of these zooxanthellae have really narrow temperature ranges, meaning that they don't tolerate temperature ranges outside of this narrow condition that they thrive in essentially. And so what happens is when the ocean begins to warm, it's going to actually drive the algae out. They are expelled from the coral and so the coral is going to then be bleached. That's why its color changes. And that's why it becomes kind of white and crusty and can potentially be a lot more prone to things like disease. And so it's gonna be a really detrimental impact here to the coral reef ecosystem when the temperature starts to rise and those algae are forced to leave because the conditions of the ocean are no longer in their range of tolerance, specifically with regard to temperature. So now we'll take a look at some more human impacts on coral reef ecosystems. So as we just pointed out, this is a little bit of a review, but it's helpful to have down. One of the biggest ways that we disrupt coral reef ecosystems is via greenhouse gas emissions. So as we combust fossil fuels, as we cut down trees and add more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, the earth warms. And when the earth warms, the ocean warms. And remember that when the ocean warms, those zooxanthellae, those beneficial algae that live with the coral are forced to leave because it's no longer within their range of tolerance. And this is what we call coral bleaching. The coral becomes a lot weaker. It becomes susceptible to disease. It doesn't have nearly as much energy to repair itself when those algae leave. And so this is gonna be a really big problem for the coral reef ecosystem. Another way that humans can disrupt coral reef ecosystems is by both overfishing, which just removes some of the fish that are gonna be beneficial to this ecosystem, but also by bottom trolling, which is a method of fishing where a huge net is dragged along the ground of the ocean the ocean floor, I should say. And you can see here, this diagram helps us understand how that can actually physically break the coral reef. It can snag portions of the coral reef and remove it or break it so that it's no longer you know, joined with the rest of the reef. It can kick up a lot of sediment so we can see how dark and murky the water gets. That's going to potentially clog fish gills or make it harder for them to see. It's also going to make sunlight less available in the ocean as it's not gonna penetrate nearly as deep. And so the algae that depend on that may suffer. So a lot of harmful effects of overfishing or poor fishing practices like bottom trolling when we talk about the coral reef ecosystem.
Now, another big threat to coral reef ecosystems is urban and agricultural runoff. So you can see here in this diagram that we just have a ton of different sources of pollutants from land that are all going to drain into the ocean and are going to lead to some problems. We're going to focus on three specific types here that I think are really important to understand. And remember, huge theme of Unit 8 is knowing specific pollutants and their specific effects. So let's look at three examples here. Uh, we have sediment pollution, which is a really broad catch-all phrase for just any little bit of matter, basically solid matter that, that is swept into these coral reef ecosystems by all of the watershed that drains into them. So these could be rivers that are passing through a farmland or through a forested area that's been clear-cut, sand, you know, silt, gravel, little bits of organic matter. This is all going to be sediment that's going to make the water a lot more turbid a lot more cloudy, it's gonna limit the amount of sunlight coming through. And so that can be really harmful to the producers in the ocean, which remember are the base of the food web. So those effects can kind of ripple up through the food web, can also block out the sunlight so that the algae that live in the coral are not able to photosynthesize as well. And so sediment pollution may not seem like such a big deal, um, but it's really impactful to coral reef ecosystems. Then we have toxicants. Now I wanna be careful about the word toxicants here and kind of highlight something. A toxicant is different than a toxin. The word toxin is really misused a lot of times. That suffix in at the end of toxin refers to the fact that that substance is made by a biological organism. Um, so most, and that's kind of redundant, but an organism. Um, so most substances that we call toxins in like pop culture and the media, they're not actually toxins. Lead is not a toxin. It's a neurotoxicant. And so a toxicant is a chemical, something synthetic produced by humans that is a toxic, that you know has detrimental effects to organisms. And so we just wanna be careful there. I don't know that you'd lose an FRQ point, but it's also always better to uh, write like a scholar when you can. So anyway, toxicants, you know, chemicals synthesized by humans are gonna be things like sunscreen from beachgoers, oil from roadways, pesticides from agricultural runoff. And those can be directly toxic or lethal to organisms in coral reef ecosystems. They can kill fish, they can kill algae, and so that's just going to have a direct lethality to those organisms. And then finally, we have nutrients. So nutrients are going to be things like ammonia from you know CAFOs or things like nitrate-containing fertilizers from lawns or golf courses, and phosphates that can come from detergents that are you know left in poorly treated sewage or also phosphates from fertilizers. So all of those three different types of pollutants are ones that are especially harmful to coral reef ecosystems.